None of them looked like me. None of them wanted me. Their long blonde tresses sweeping my dignity because I looked in the mirror and it was empty. Systems, each line of code intended this. I got worried they could hear my heavy breathing. I could sing in the choir, but I would stand in the back. Waste of so many people, Rosa's roses shrivel on her grave as my dignity is washed further in the waters I am abjured by. They used to call me weed. I choose to grow because I learned how uncomfortable the seed is under pressure. I choose to grow because though some confused me for weed, I stayed there. And I learned that I have a place here and you cannot pick me out like the rest. None of them liked me. None of them would talk to me. One word misheard spiraled into the scripts of villainy, a cloak of invisibility I could only wear when I didn't want it. My lips taped shut with fear when I should have been safe. I'm growing because I choose to stay grounded. The sweet soil is sugar to my soul. The water nourishes my grief. I grow because leaves mean opportunities and seeds spread just like love. Judgment pellets raining down on me, leaving welts, each welt never faded, as the bruises get worse every day. My body, black and bruised, hurt and used, was not a child's body. A child is not youth anymore after seeing herself fade in the mirror. I choose to grow because they used to call me weed, but I did not let them pick me out like the rest. Tell her voice, tell her voice, go, go, go. 
touch it, this is not yours This is only one take, I got five more Yeah, I ain't worried about the next man I got vision like Xavier from X-Men So if I fail, it's the next plan And if I fail the next plan, it's the next plan Yeah, I ain't really tripping on the L Cause when you lose, you be better on yourself I'd rather be out here than be in jail Writing, checking letters in the mail I'd rather see my brothers doing well Than talking to my brothers in the cell And if you couldn't already tell I'd rather be in heaven than in hell And I'd rather starve and be a glutton of this world Keep your money, keep your car and your plastic girl And I'd rather run than know that I would be a slave To the system of this world that's keeping everyone in chains On the top floor Walking in, what I gotta knock for Buddy, please don't touch, this is not yours This is only one take, I got five more Yeah, I ain't worried about the next man I got vision like Xavier from X-Men So if I fail, it's the next plan And if I fail the next plan, it's the next plan Yeah Welcome, everyone. I'd like to start the show by acknowledging Destiny Arts, a youth dance company based in Oakland. Oakland! So excited. So my name is Mona Shamali. I'm the director of the New Leaders Initiative, a program of Earth Island that puts on the Brower Youth Awards every year. And the Brower Youth Awards is really the premier award for youth environmental leadership uh, among youth and college age. So tonight we have a spread of youth from 16 to 21 who are all leaders in their own right. I'm going to come over to the podium now because I haven't memorized everything. Okay, so... Um, I'd like to tell you what New Leaders does. New Leaders is a program that coaches and supports young people to envision and see a possibility for what they can accomplish in, accomplish in the environmental movement. That's our program. We believe in growing young people to rise to the highest version of themselves, helping them remove obstacles between them and their dreams, and to express their deeply felt passion and activism. So moving on to the theme for this year. The theme is moving forward together. A reminder that the environmental movement would not be possible without teamwork, a movement in which everyone has a role and is valued for their unique contributions. It is youth leaders that lead teams in new dynamic ways that break the barriers of what leadership has been in the past. This year's theme was inspired by a proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Moving forward is exactly what we are doing, led by youth who are on the front lines, the youth you will meet tonight. The term moving has two definitions. The first is to be in motion. The second is producing strong emotion, especially sympathy. For our theme tonight, we are using both definitions. We are in motion towards being better stewards of our planet, and we are also producing emotion in the sense that we are appealing to people's love of their environment landscape and ecosystems and all the life forms that inhabit them. 
Young people are in the best position to move forward together because they collectively feel the peril that they believe they will experience in their lifetimes. Throughout the years, Brower Youth Award winners have shown us that they are willing to put aside their differences and move as a team towards their goals, making space for everyone to participate. New Leaders Initiative is honored to work with 2023's team, which has so much to teach us. So now I would like to introduce someone very special, our new CEO, Shimona. It is my pleasure to introduce Shimona, who has become the CEO of Earth Island this past spring. Previously, she was Earth Island's general counsel and helped initiate several groundbreaking lawsuits, lawsuits, including one here in California over plastic pollution. Shimona is also the mother of two young children, a bike enthusiast, and a returned Peace Corps volunteer. Please help me welcome to the stage, Shimona. Hi, everybody. It is so great to be here. It is so wonderful to see all of your faces. It is especially great to see all of the young people in the audience tonight, including my eldest daughter right down here. As Mona said, I am Shimona Majumdar. I'm the new Chief Executive Officer at Earth Island Institute. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and here at Earth Island, we are a community of and for environmental activism. You might be asking yourself, well, what does that mean? What it means is that we believe that individuals and their communities hold the solutions to creating a more just, equitable and sustainable world where all life can thrive. And we at Earth Island are committed to doing the, world, doing the work to help making that change happen. And we're doing it in a number of ways. We're telling the stories of environmental activists, the issues that they, that they work on, and the way that those issues intersect with other social issues. We're supporting the work of a large group of activist projects. We're giving them tools, we're coaching, we're providing administrative support, and giving them access to legal counsel so that they can engage in those mission-critical lawsuits. We're celebrating and supporting the next generation of environmental leaders, which of course is why we're all here tonight. And let me tell you, the group we have tonight, they've already accomplished incredible things with their respective communities. And they've grown, they've grown a bond together over the past week through team building exercises and workshops that they participated in as part of the leadership week that we put on. And now they are joining a community of Brower Youth Award winners that is over 140 individuals strong. <laughs> Needless to say, I am so excited to see what they're gonna be able to accomplish together because really we are stronger when we work together as a community. And I hope tonight that you feel a sense of inspiration and I hope that you feel a sense of the community that, that we are creating here. And if after tonight you wanna to learn more about Earth Island, please visit our website where you can subscribe to our award-winning journal. You can sign up for our free monthly newsletter called Island Wire and you can read all about the amazing things that we're doing. So, okay, I think I've said enough. Let's get on with the show and learn more about these amazing young individuals here that are the 2023 Brower Youth Award winners. ¿Qué creo? Creo en la comunidad. Creo en la unión. Creo en lo que estamos haciendo. Creo en la fuerza que, que surge cuando voces y manos se unen a trabajar por un objetivo. Y es justamente como se forma Colmena. Así que, que creo en eso. Creo en la gente que identifica una, una necesidad y que trabaja y se une para poder abordarla. Es que me uno a Colmena Cimarrona y aporto mi granito de arena para esta lucha por la soberanía alimentaria. Soy una mujer afrodescendiente de la isla municipio de Vieques, Puerto Rico. 
Esta isla depende de un sistema de transporte marítimo para transportar combustible, alimentos y acceder a servicios de salud. Vieques actualmente importa más del 90% de lo que consume y los precios de los alimentos son 40% más altos que los de la Isla Grande. Durante más de 60 años, mi comunidad fue el sitio principal de las prácticas militares realizadas por la Marina de Guerra de Estados Unidos. Estas prácticas militares contaminaron nuestra tierra con toxinas y metales pesados que han creado una cadena de degradación ambiental en el territorio. Yo soy parte de la Colmena Cimarrona. La Colmena Cimarrona es una organización sin fines de lucro fundada en el 2019. Eh, tras el paso del huracán María en el 2017, eh, un colectivo de mujeres se reunieron para apoyar a la comunidad, especialmente cubriendo temas de alimentación. Cuando pienso en las cosas que me motivaron a hacer algo, me veo yendo al supermercado y viendo estas góndolas vacías, deseando, queriendo comerme una lechuga fresca, un tomate, una ensalada bien rica, ir al supermercado y no poder encontrar esto. Y es una situación que ocurre constantemente, y más aún cuando, cuando el huracán María pasó, que estuvimos meses sin recibir, eh, sin tener comunicación, sin tener servicios de luz, de agua. Fue una falta de servicios básicos que, que, que había en, en Vieques y en todo Puerto Rico. El pensar en que me quiero comer esto y no hay. Así que en Colmena Cimarrona veo este espacio, esta oportunidad de poder trabajar. Cuando alguien quiera algo fresco, accesible, un precio justo, tenga una opción o un lugar a donde recurrir. La Colmena Cimarrona fue fundada ante la necesidad de atender la crisis sanitaria, alimentaria y social en Vieques. Con práctica agroecológica se rescató un terreno que convertimos en un oasis de esperanza, una finca comunitaria. A través de prácticas de economía solidaria, agroecología y apicultura, construimos soberanía alimentaria en el archipiélago puertorriqueño. Algo bien importante que hace Colmena es educar. Es una finca escuela, es poder promover estas prácticas agroecológicas, esta herramienta de libertad que es cosechar, sembrar tu propio alimento eh, de una forma que sea justa, sana y accesible. Definitivamente, Katherine, además de que es líder y trabaja organizando, también es, tiene una ética de trabajo impresionante. Podía estar cansada, podía haber estado otras noches estudiando y aún así le metía a la finca, que es un trabajo también bastante fuerte. Así que fue una inspiración verla acá en este rol en la finca, pero también haberla visto desarrollarse en su rol como maestra ahora, verla como educadora de esas próximas generaciones. Es impresionante poder tener jóvenes así, verdad, que nos llenan de esperanza. Cuando pienso en el activismo juvenil, Creo que le trae una llama diferente a la lucha porque al haber jóvenes que continúan interesados en, en estos procesos de activismo, se aseguran que haya un relevo, un relevo intergeneracional, que es sumamente importante porque estas luchas no, no van a acabarse ahora. Así que es importante que estas personas jóvenes sean impactadas por lo que estamos haciendo para que ellos continúen estas labores. Uno de los, de los roles más importantes que pueden tener los jóvenes en, esta, en este trabajo que estamos haciendo, ese trabajo de, de unir, de conectar, de, de, de llevar este mensaje hacia el futuro. Creo que es la manera en que Vieques y el mundo entero ¿verdad? puede solucionar o, o llegar ¿verdad? a a soluciones más eh, efectivas. Creo que en la comunidad es que está la, la solución. Tuve el privilegio de crecer frente al mar caribeño, viendo los atardeceres en las playas más hermosas. En mi piel llegó el color que me deja el sol y el perfume del baño de sal en aguas cristalinas. Pero ser de una isla tan codiciada tiene un alto precio. Soy hija de un territorio que ha sufrido la violencia colonial de Estados Unidos, Puerto Rico, un archipiélago en el Caribe. 
Aquí, en el 1940, la Marina de Guerra de Estados Unidos se apoderó del 82% del territorio de la isla municipio de Vieques, en donde vivo. Muchos tuvieron que emigrar. Vieques fue el espacio para practicar con bombas de múltiples contaminantes tóxicos, incluyendo agente naranja. Los viequenses siempre le hicimos frente a la marina, con estrategias creativas y caseras como los fueron, como los, fueron los rescates de tierra, el uso de colmenas de abejas contra, y, y los usos de, de colmenas de abejas contra los, los, contra los marinos. Así fue nuestra vida por 60 años, en convivencia y lucha contra la contaminación de nuestras tierras, nuestros cuerpos y el desplazamiento violento de la comunidad viequense. En el 2003, gracias a la lucha de nuestro pueblo, a las movilizaciones masivas y al apoyo internacional, logramos sacar a la Marina de Guerra de Estados Unidos, demostrando que la solidaridad prevalece. Hoy, luego de 20 años de esa memorable lucha, nuestro pueblo aún no tiene acceso al 100% de su territorio. Ya no es la Marina de Guerra la que nos desplaza sino los extranjeros de alto capital que deciden comprar no una ni dos, sino tres o más propiedades y tierras para hacerlas Airbnb o su espacio para vacacionar, dejando a viequenses sin acceso a su tierra. Un pueblo que no tiene tierra no tiene autonomía. Estas y otras políticas coloniales, como la Ley Jones de Cabotaje del 1917, estrangulan las posibilidades de una vivienda digna para nuestro pueblo. Vieques importa más del 90% de su comida, que solo puede llegar de puertos del estado de Florida, y luego de ser transportada, cuando se logra transportar, en un ferry ineficiente, es vendida a un precio 40% más alto que el de la isla grande de Puerto Rico, además de haber perdido su valor nutricional. Hoy, un pueblo que no se puede alimentar es un pueblo que muere. La Colmena Cimarrona busca crear espacios donde podamos florecer en un mundo tan tóxico, en constante degradación ambiental, en las mismas comunidades más vulnerables ante la crisis climática. Buscamos contrarrestar la crisis alimentaria en Vieques, produciendo alimentos de manera saludable y accesible mediante prácticas de agroecología comunitaria y apicultura. Tenemos la intención de eliminar las desigualdades existentes desarrollando una economía local solidaria que promueva el apoyo mutuo y la equidad, aspirando a la soberanía alimentaria en el archipiélago de Puerto Rico, en hermandad con nuestro Caribe. Vinimos no solo a sobrevivir o a ser resilientes, sino a permanecer, a cosechar los frutos de nuestra tierra. De Vieques no nos desplaza nadie, por eso, construimos colmenas de resistencias, nuestros palenques, nuestro oasis, reimaginando y redefiniendo nuestra existencia en este territorio que tanto nos ha costado luchar. Estamos creando oportunidades económicas para quienes sembramos de manera sostenible en Vieques, ofreciendo espacios de cuidado que aseguran nuestra permanencia. Esta lucha es personal. El 6 de julio de este año fui agredida en una protesta por defender mis tierras. Fui arrestada injustamente y me encuentro en libertad bajo fianza por defender mi territorio. Seguiremos defendiendo nuestras tierras, donde sea que vayamos. Hoy estamos aquí compartiendo este espacio con otros defensores del territorio y seguiremos construyendo juntos el mundo que queremos. Uno con mayor justicia social donde podamos vivir con dignidad. Seguimos en lucha. Gracias. Youth activism brings new perspectives, new approaches, and new energy to any movement. The youth of today are really stepping up and realizing that unless they take action, no one else will. Whether it's the climate crisis or salmon going extinct here in the Northwest, these issues are no longer problems of the future, threats that are yet to come. These are issues that we're facing on a day-to-day -day basis. My project 
is WIORCA, which stands for the Washington Youth Ocean and River Conservation Alliance. The purpose of WIORCA is to advocate the breaching of the four lower Snake River dams in southeastern Washington. These four dams over the past 50 years where they've been in place have unfortunately decimated northwest Chinook salmon along the Snake Columbia River system. These salmon are very important for a number of reasons, one being that they are a keystone species on which 137 other species in the Northwest directly depend on. But furthermore, these salmon are a very important cultural keystone for many Columbia Basin tribes. The movement to remove the Lower Snake River dams has long been devoid of the same regional notoriety as the general climate movement. And as a result, policymakers have not felt the same urgency to address the dam's effects on orca and salmon, resulting in decades of inaction despite pushback from scientists, tribal leaders, and conservation NGOs since the installation of the dams in the 1970s. Many studies have shown that unless these four dams on the Lower Snake River are removed or breached, these salmon are likely to go extinct within our lifetimes. What Wyorka does is we educate communities, specifically focusing on youth and students in K through 12 schools about the issue that's going on in southeastern Washington, including about why these Chinook salmon are so important to Northwest ecosystems, about the cultural significance they hold, and other reasons um, these salmon are so important. And then we go into the background of why these dams in particular are having such an outsized impact on the salmon. The other thing we do is advocating for civic engagement. So we organize things like postcard drives, letter writing events, and lobbying from Washington State all the way to Washington, D.C. to support the breaching of these dams. I believe that there is no goal more important to humanity and to our planet um, than ending the climate crisis. I believe it is impossible to have a stable planet without first having stable ecosystems. Wairka was given a personalized letter of commendation penned by U.S. Representative Derek Kilmer from Washington's 6th Congressional District for our impactful work and youth engagement on this key Northwest issue. Senator Murray's office recognized Wyorka as the largest independent youth coalition in Washington advocating for salmon and orca recovery. In January 2023, I organized the first Washington Youth Conservation Summit Slash Rally, a student-led march at the state capitol urging state legislators to allocate the necessary funds for infrastructure investments to replace the dams. The event drew in over 100 students from as far as three hours away and over 20 partner NGOs. Wyorka has grown to 25 year-round youth volunteers across schools encompassing 6,000 students. I've educated 1,700 students and more with awareness campaigns reaching over 50,000 Washington and Idaho residents. At this stage, we are focusing on expansion to more schools and cities to reach a larger audience. All these environmental issues we're facing today are connected, and in order to address any one of them, whether it's the climate crisis, whether it's addressing um, the health of our oceans, the health of our terrestrial ecosystems, it means that we have to address all of them. It means that um, our salmon need to recover, our orca need to recover. It means that we as humanity need to learn to live um, in balance with all these different species and learn to see ourselves as part of the global ecosystem rather than seeing ourselves as outside or above it. Dismantling hydroelectric dams to save the environment? At surface level, it sounds contradictory. But my advocacy has taught me to work within nuance, not despite it. The diet of southern resident orcas, a population native to my home state of Washington, mainly consists of Chinook salmon, many of which hail from the Snake River Columbia River system. Snake River Chinook have reduced by 90% in the 50 years since the dams were installed. Today, the southern residents are starving, with just over 70 individuals remaining. Four dams on the Lower Snake River in southeastern Washington have created reservoirs decimating salmon due to their rapidly warming waters. As long as these dams remain, so will their reservoirs and our salmon will go extinct. Starting my advocacy in familiar communities at the beginning of 10th grade, I, pro I proposed to my city's youth board that we adopt support of dismantling dams in an official public statement. The peculiarity of youth advocacy from a mid-sized suburb 250 miles from the Snake River, I hoped would catalyze awareness and support. Our youth board unanimously approved, but city council denied authorization to move forward with the statement. Hours before our pre-scheduled hearing with city council, they'd received a public comment opposing our stance. Despite the general practice in these spaces, 
to proceed undeterred, I realized convincing a divided state to support dam removal and prevent salmon extinction required first understanding the opposition. I spoke to the writer of the public comment and in doing so learned valid concerns around dam removal. Without reservoirs, how would farms be irrigated? Without shipping locks via the dams, how would inland grain reach Pacific ports on barges? Informed by my opposition, my message shifted to include calls for guaranteed infrastructure replacements alongside dismantling dams. And through this open-mindedness, my coalition was able to expand. Driven by data, first and foremost, I sought to qualify salmon as a superior asset, economically and societally, to these dams. This past April, however, I was fortunate for the opportunity to lobby for dam breaching in Washington, D.C., alongside the Umatilla Tribal Youth Council from Oregon. The cultures of the Umatilla and numerous other Columbia Basin tribes hold Chinook salmon to not only be ecologically critical, but also sacred. They taught me to understand the human side of an issue and that ecosystems cannot be treated as part of some cost-benefit analysis. The world is full of environmental challenges, as we all know, and as humanity learns to balance our flourishing with ecological stability, in this critical time, each of us must take our own time to evaluate what is non-negotiable and fight to protect it. Renewable energy at the cost of a keystone species is not clean energy, and this is the message we fight for. Nuance can take on a negative connotation in the environmental space as an excuse to not commit. But more and more, it is necessary to work within spaces of nuance, to learn from unfamiliar perspectives. As for me and everyone I work with across the Pacific Northwest, our fight to free the snake continues. It's been amazing to get to know the other Brower Youth Awardees this week, and I thank Earth Island for the opportunity. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight, and I look forward to the other speeches. Thank you. What really struck me is how much food is being wasted. In the US, one third of the food that we purchase is eventually thrown away into landfills. When our volunteers step into a school cafeteria, they're struck by how garbage bins are filled to the brim with mounds of banana peels, half bitten sandwiches, and even unopened food. In Maryland, 25.8 million pounds of food waste pile up in our landfills and incinerators just from schools. This produces the same CO2 as burning 15.7 million tons of coal when it could have been composted instead. I'm the co-founder and co-president of Compostology, which is a youth-led nonprofit dedicated to starting composting and food recovery programs at K-12 schools across both Maryland and the U.S. as a whole. It started all the way back when my co-founder and Vika and I were in seventh grade and we were in our middle school and we just saw how much wasted food was being produced each day. And we started our first composting and food recovery program. And since then, we've carried that model across to the 26 schools that we now operate at in Maryland. Compostology leads a coalition of 35,000 students, administrators, and officials to combat climate change and food insecurity by starting composting and food recovery programs in schools. On a day-to-day -day basis, these composting and food recovery programs mostly occur within the cafeteria of a school. So essentially, students at the end of lunch, when they're ready to pack up, they sort their wasted food into either the inedible category or edible food that can be donated to others, reducing the amount of wasted food rotting in landfills and getting to help out in a way that isn't really flashy because students can anonymously pick up food throughout the day without feeling judged by their peers. Our composting and food recovery programs have had a significant environmental impact, preventing nearly 51,000 pounds of food waste from reaching incinerators and diverting over 213,000 pounds of CO2 from entering the atmosphere. Our share tables rescue almost 9,000 food items monthly for students and local food banks. Our year-round programs are a culmination of 35,000 students and staff in 24 schools, and our county now offers share tables to any interested school. They had a proof of concept almost immediately, and when something works and it works well, that, that builds the buzz. And so the next school can simply look at how things have gone at the first school, talk to the people that had done that work. Their best cheerleaders were the people they'd already worked with, and that, to me, means you're a success. 
with this model, we've also been really invested in building an infrastructure for other students to get involved. What we've done is work together with state delegates, county officials, county board of education members, local environmental officials like the Department of Environmental Protection to form the Maryland Coalition to Reimagine School Waste. And from there, um, we helped our delegates create the Senate Bill 124. Um, for the Maryland General Assembly in 2022. And this essentially created the first grant program of its kind to assist other schools across Maryland. And then our major part we did was passing it. We sent uh, around 16,000 postcards to the Maryland General Assembly. So specific legislators, as well as the Maryland Secretary of the Environment, Nick Ilwain, as well as um, the Maryland Governor, Wes Moore. We've also been meeting with students from Rhode Island, Hawaii, and other states um, on how they can start their programs. I think youth really is the center of compostology. We think of ourselves as a youth-led organization and we maintain it that way. And so to any youth activists out there, what I really say is to go out, meet with your legislators, talk with them, and demand what you want to see. I think youth activism is extremely powerful because we have this unbridled and unrestrained passion um, to demand what we want to see happen. Sometimes you might be the only one making calls every day. You might be the one sending two emails in one day to get something done. But if that's what needs to be done, then so be it. I hope for a clean and equitable world where students of all backgrounds have access to clean environment and the resources they need. So go out there and fight for what you believe in. Thank you all so much. So imagine you're walking out of the supermarket, carrying three bags of groceries, and then you drop one of them in the parking lot before going home. You might think that's crazy, because who would waste that much perfectly good food? But the truth is, the United States throws away one third of our food each year, or one in three grocery bags. That's the issue that Compostology, our youth-led nonprofit, was founded on. When I started middle school, my partner, Avika, and I wanted to make an environmental impact in our schools. And in high school, we wanted to do it as they were reopening after the pandemic. But the question was, where? The answer lied within our own school system. In my school system at Montgomery County Public Schools, one in three children receive free or reduced price meals that oftentimes account for their breakfast or lunch, but that doesn't necessarily account for their dinner or their entire family's well-being. When we researched examples outside of Maryland to alleviate the issue of wasted food in schools, we landed on starting a composting and food recovery program during the most exciting part of any student's day, lunch. After convincing our first school to begin a program, I went out to guide students during lunch. And as Avika and I and our other volunteers walked around from table to table in the bright and bustling cafeteria, I got to know the students who were there and also answer questions about the program. Listening to them, I realized that so many students possess an untapped enthusiasm and eagerness for to partake in a new program that protects the environment that they learn about every day in science class, and they go out to play in during recess. But even more, it helps with the paradox that we face in our own school cafeterias, where you can have students who go home to an empty refrigerator, sitting feet away from trash cans that are filled to the brim with food that's oftentimes unopened and perfectly edible. And so, since then, we've worked with administration, staff, students, and parents at 24 schools to start our composting and food recovery programs. Yet what I honestly didn't necessarily expect from the very beginning was the power of schools to be hubs of community-wide change. Like the ripple effect, practices that we introduced and showed to students became that much easier for parents and entire families to institute. And through our newsletters and educational materials, teachers and parents began questioning how they could join in. And soon we were connecting them with our haulers and government leaders to bring our programs to their own homes. One of the greatest realizations I've had from this process is the power of youth as decision makers. Although we may not be the ones sitting in legislatures and signing off on bills, we have the power to institutionalize practices that will impact our future. 
to pass a Maryland bill to fund schools in starting their own programs, oftentimes ones that receive Title I funding. We tapped into students' passion by launching a postcards campaign to directly tell legislators why their constituents, students, care. And as I read postcards from kindergartners coloring pictures of thriving wildlife and humans living together in harmony, to high schoolers talking about the impact that food insecurity has on their everyday lives, we realized that the power of students is not in just being the leaders of tomorrow, but being in the leaders of today. And with the bill passed, and when the bill passed with bipartisan support in the Maryland House and Senate, it was a testament to not only our countless written and oral testimonies from Confusology leadership, but also the 16,000 students across 77 schools who took five minutes out of their day to write a postcard and stand together with us. Today, I challenge each one of us to doubt the societal norms that we accept as everyday convention. Whether it's as small as whether to buy that extra bag of chips we know will never finish, or going to our city council and state, state legislature to advocate for saving our daily food, we each have the agency to take our future on. So before I go, I just want to say some quick thank yous to the Earth Island Institute for organizing these awards, as well as my fellow peers, the Brower Youth Awardees, who I know I'll be looking on Instagram to see what great things they do in the future as well. Um, and then I also want to give a special shout out to my partner, Crime Advika, who never fails to surprise me with her ingenuity and geniusness. Thank you all. <laughs> Wow, right? Yeah. It's going good so far. <laughs> so it is my pleasure to introduce for our halftime show the Oakland Youth Chorus. They have been around for 49 years. Is Linnell anywhere around? I think it's 49 years. And they empower youth uh, through the art of singing. And they are just fantastic, and I'm so happy that they are with us here tonight for the second time. So I would like to introduce Oakland Youth Chorus. Walk oh, I can walk around. <laughs> she never gave me a mic. <laughs> so yes, we are the Oakland Youth Chorus. I'm the artistic director for the Oakland Youth Chorus, Linnell Martin, and we are happy, ecstatic to be here with you guys again. We are ecstatic because this is actually our very first gig for the, for the season. So these young people have been working for a couple, only a few weeks. And so we're just excited to get here and try out some of our, our, of our things. We're gonna sing a, three songs for you tonight, or this afternoon, this evening, this day, today, something, yeah. Um, we're gonna sing a, couple, a few songs for you guys. If you are inclined and would love to sing with us, please join in with us. We just love to have fun and just love to have an opportunity to, ch to share with some of the things that we are trying to tell the story. My thing for them, and they know, when I say um, we're going to sing a song, we have to tell the story of the song. So the, the composer didn't write it just to, to put a whole bunch of words out there. He wrote it to give us a story. And so that is what we're gonna try and do, is give you the story of our songs. Our first song is Sarah Borella's Kaleidoscope's Heart, and then we're gonna follow with the spiritual. And if you guys know this spiritual, please sing along with us. It is called Hold On. We have a few soloists that will start, I mean, I'm sorry, we will um, move on with that. And if you guys will and, and can sing with us, hold on, fight on, pray on, sing on, march on. Um, what am I missing? 
I think that's it. And then our last song is one song that we love right now. It's um, Jim Popoli's um, Give Us Hope. And we just want, with so much of the craziness that's going on in the world, and people bombing people, and people jacking people, and people bipping people, and people people people, um, we just want to share some love and just, there's hope. These young people and the things that's going on that we're giving these wonderful people um, an opportunity to share, um, this is our hope. So we hope, we hope you guys, we, I hope you enjoy our hopeful concert here. So.
We have our wonderful accompanist tonight, Mr. Caleb is here to accompany us on this, give us hope. It's really nice to have him play because they usually hear me play and I'm not the best at <laughs> I understand there is a youth representative here on the first bench, and I'm sorry I can't give you more than a few minutes, but, but please, since you represent the future generation, at least in this room, uh, can, you, can you give us a... You can come up here. Please present yourself and be quick. Hi, my name is Will Sharuis. Um, I'm 16 years old and from Miami, Florida. I founded a youth organization called We Are Forces of Nature to help halt and slow down climate change. I grew up in Miami, Florida, and I've had the absolute gift to spend a lot of my free time outside on the ocean. My home, which sits at ground zero sea level, 
will be uninhabitable due to sea level rise caused by global warming. Back in 2017, Hurricane Irma really affected my community firsthand. I mean, the entire city of Miami was virtually underwater. There was even a boat that washed over my school's football field. And with that, I felt a personal need to act. And I felt that it was almost a moral responsibility of mine to take this into my own hands and do what I could do to help stop this issue. So after the hurricane, I founded a nonprofit organization called We Are Force of Nature. My goal was simple, to halt climate change and help protect my community. So most people know mangroves as doing two main things. Number one is preventing beach erosion, and number two is just serving as a marine habitat. But what a lot of people don't realize is mangroves actually sequester carbon at a rate much faster than traditional forests or evergreen trees. Scientists predict that even if we were to stop emitting greenhouse gas, we'd have to take a billion tons of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere every year to maintain a habitable planet. But with mangroves being really efficient, I see that as nature's number one way to help this issue. So far, Force of Nature has replenished six miles of mangrove coastline, and we've replanted 1,149 mangroves. The A Million Mangroves Initiative is a really inclusive, easy, and imperative solution. Youth can start out by just getting a group of friends together, going to the mangroves and cleaning up trash. Also, for the plantings, it's pretty straightforward. You just collect the prompt and use a wash up on the beach, water them, and then eventually replant them in the place you found them. This initiative can be broken down into four main parts the cleanups, the replantings, the education, and the research. For the cleanups and the replantings, they're pretty straightforward. Every weekend, I get a group of friends, and we go out into the mangrove forest by my home, and we clean up and we just replant mangroves in the areas where mangroves once lived. Then, for the education, I travel around, whether it's to different schools in my community or to different events globally, and speak on the benefits of planting mangroves. Lastly, the research part. I try and research and find ways mangroves are going to be able to be replanted in the future to better withstand the warming oceans. At the Amelia Mangroves Lab, I'm pioneering mangroves to better withstand the warming oceans and ocean acidification. To do this, I've been exposing mangroves to higher concentrations of salt and temperatures and growing them for long growth periods. Fortunately, I'm able to say that my planting success rate exceeds the norm and is approximately 70%. To scale up the A Million Mangroves Initiative, I've been able to share my solution at the United Nations headquarters in Bonn, Germany, Stockholm 50, and at the request of the U.S. State Department with conservationists visiting from five continents. I've also been able to teach the younger generation how they can grow mangroves, whether it's on their windowsills or right in their backyards. If we can scale up this project, then we have a fighting chance to halt climate change. Youth don't really have the patience for all the bureaucracy that goes on. And we sort of have an optimistic approach. We don't really see roadblocks hindering us to getting things done. We also recognize that if we don't act now, the changes that affect our planet are going to be irreversible. Personally, I think that the power of one is really important. And that one person, one action can make a difference. The hardest part is to take the first step. I'm really hopeful that if my initiative can at least empower another youth to act, then maybe that youth can empower one of their friends to act, and it can sort of snowball from there. And I, I just have hope that we really can turn things around for our planet. Hello everyone, Miami is a beautiful city and I've grown up with the incredible opportunity to spend my free time fishing and free diving the reefs off of the Florida coast. But it's the mangrove swamps that are my playground and propel my action. A little over a century ago, my hometown was a mangrove swamp, but we've now paved over 90% in the name of redevelopment. And it isn't just a Miami story. It's going on all over the world. Mangroves once covered 75% of the coastlines in the world, but scientists estimate 
that in the past 50 years alone, half of the world's mangrove cover has been lost. So why does all of this matter? I started restoring mangroves to protect Florida's coast from the erosion after Hurricane Irma flooded my city back in 2017. But scientists have now determined that the greatest threat to humanity is not sea level rise. It's the heat. The answer lies within nature. Plants have been sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere for the last three billion years. And if we can foster that, we can break the heat and save humanity. And it turns out that the massive root systems of mangroves sequester carbon better than any other tree on Earth. So my goal is to use my research at the Amelia Mangroves Lab to increase carbon sequestration and to get a million mangroves in the ground by 2030. So far, we've restored more than six miles of mangroves along the coast, planted 1,100 mangroves, distributed 900 plants, and educated over 2,500 youth across Miami and in 16 different countries around the world on mangroves as a solution. But the real solution comes with scale. So I've taken the opportunity to share my A Million Mangroves initiative at United Nations climate conferences in Madrid, Glasgow, Scotland, Stockholm, Lisbon, and upcoming in Dubai. And already, we have partners in Gabon and Cameroon. These are places that rely on mangroves for their very own survival. I am an optimist, and I refuse to see the world through a bleak lens. I believe hope is the most powerful antidote in our universe. In that minute before midnight mentality that pervades my peers, it's real. But we now have the solutions to halt the climate crisis. And the A Million Mangroves Initiative is just one of them. I credit my peers, starting with the awardees here tonight, who are rewriting the narrative. The youth are the doers. We are the yes we can thinkers. We are innovators and we have vast optimism. I encourage all of you to join in and be part of the solution. Ask hard questions, stay curious, push for answers, and take action. I want to thank the Earth Island Institute for this tremendous opportunity to scale my project, and for the opportunity to learn from the other phenomenal 2023 Brower Youth Award recipients. They are a testament to the fact that the youth are not only the future, we are the present and we are changing the world. Thank you. So I've always been passionate about hiking from a very young age. I absolutely love hiking. I love being outdoors. And I really found myself in the minority in a lot of spaces after reading lots of articles and research on the relationship between people of color and the outdoors, I really found this was a pertinent issue that I really wanted to address and, and change in my community. Hype Girls arranges hikes, nature walks, and guest lectures for teenage girls of color to promote a love for the outdoors, building an environmental movement, and create an inclusive community for a historically marginalized group that often does not get to benefit from nature and the outdoors environment. The key issue I am addressing for my organization is the lack of representation of girls of color in nature and building a pure community that appreciates, benefits from, and gives back to our environment. Nature has a very strong ability to nurture and help our emotional and physical well-being. I found that a lot in my personal life, how nature has supported me and how being outdoors has supported me in countless ways. And so I hope girls of color can reap the benefits of that and feel safe in being outdoors and feel like they belong in those spaces. While the physical benefits of hiking are well known, there is now increasing research to show that hiking and spending time in nature has a significant positive impact on mental health, an area where teenage girls of color often face unique challenges such as racism and discrimination. Through guided meditation, we learned about grounding ourselves like trees with deep, strong roots, listening to the sounds of nature, and using aspects of the natural world to help us realize our senses to live in the present moment. These interactions have allowed us to discuss the unique pressures and stressors that teenage girls of color might face in society and how to identify how we can engage with nature for our well-being and stay nurtured and resilient when handling mental health challenges. We encourage youth to go out, 
hike, walk, and connect with themselves on a deeper level, work on their mental health. And through that, I'm hoping to also develop a new generation of leaders who can continue the work of hype, continue recruiting people, emphasizing the importance of hiking and nature. I think it's really important to have youth activism because we can all relate to one another. The girls that are a part of hype, the people that come on my hikes, we're all of the same age. We're able to relate to one another and we're able to share our experiences and stories so that we are really able to help nurture and support each other in the same way. The community we've built around hiking, I'd say is a positive one because it really is a space for people to just be able to talk and talk freely. Before, I would have kind of just see the hike as something that I had to do. Whereas now, it was something that I look forward to. So I hope that with Hype's impact, girls of color will feel empowered to reclaim outdoor spaces of their own. I hope that girls will really be able to use the outdoors as a source of healing and as a source of power for our own mental health issues, and also to really understand the impact of hiking in nature to support our physical and emotional well-being. I believe that change really truly happens one person at a time, and that is why the work of Hype is so dear and important to me. And I feel that every single person that Hype touches, either emotionally or physically helps them, makes all the difference. By building a new community of young people who develop a love for nature and the environment, we create a passionate groundswell of people who will protect and fight for saving our environment by role modeling to their friends, families, and next generations. Hi everyone, how's everyone doing today? Good, I'm also doing good. Um, I would like to start with a quote. The divine trees and curative herbs appeared through yugas before the emergence of deities and billions of years before the origin of any other being. The divine manifested as trees, herbs, and plants at various places on the earth. These godly appearances were meant to destroy pain, suffering, ailments, and heal wounds of all living creatures. Without any discrimination between man and animal, these saintly trees and herbs have equally blessed all beings. The Rig Veda, an ancient Indian scripture written over 3,000 years ago, displays an understanding of nature's healing and curative powers and leads directly to the work I am being recognized for today, Hype Girls. I incubated Hype Girls, which stands for Hiking Youth Program for Equity Girls, during the summer of 2021. I was fortunate to attend a two-week rock climbing and backpacking Colorado Outward Bound school trip through the Rocky Mountains. At the time, I was coping with the traumatic experience of social exclusion as a girl of color attending a predominantly white school. Adding to the uncertainties of the COVID pandemic, I had lost most of my self-confidence. On the Outward Bound trip, I found that nature was there for guidance and support. The longer I spent immersed in the outdoors, the more I began to appreciate nature as a form of healing. Slowly, I harnessed the strength nature gave me and found a way forward. Upon my return, I kept my experiences as a source of motivation. I continued to traverse the outdoors, but found myself in the minority as a girl of color. I explored the topic of diversity in hiking and was alarmed at the findings on the systematic disparities that disadvantage people of color from outdoor experiences. Additionally, I wanted to focus on the intersection between nature and our mental health, an area where teenage girls of color face unique challenges. As I contacted women leaders of local hiking groups around me and my program coordinator at Outward Bound, Ms. Jackie Kusain, I began Hype Girls, an idea that sprouted from a summer trip has grown into something meaningful in just over two years. One particular incident comes to mind that I believe captures the essence of hype. On a hike in the fall, we had a new member, a 14-year-old African-American girl. She suddenly stepped back and I could sense her fear and hesitation. Afterward, it was apparent that she feared the woods despite never personally having had a bad experience. There was trauma and the field of epigenetics is now confirming this. She felt much safer by talking about it and feeling the group's support. In the summer of 2022, I traveled to Tanzania with my father and successfully summited Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest freestanding mountain in the world. As I stood on the roof of Africa, quite literally, I felt overcome with pride. It inspired me to hold on to my passion for hype and to persevere in my efforts. While change is a process, the impact will come one person at a time. The Brower Youth Award is a great recognition that I am on the right path, and I'm energized to normalize outdoor adventures for historically marginalized groups, have them benefit from interacting with nature, and provide a sense of community and connection. One hike at a time, Hype Girls leads to a focus on preserving and protecting our environment. 
I also want to say a huge thank you to the Earth Island Institute for having us, as well as the fellow awardees, and uh, Mona Shamali and Susanna Lee for coordinating an amazing week. Thank you very much. <laughs>are the center forefront leaders of the clean energy campaign and Utah Youth Environmental Solutions. We drive the vision of what we want the world to look like and our adult allies and organizations are uplifting and supporting that vision. The goal of the campaign amongst all of the young people that are leading it here is to build this generation of leaders that are civically engaged, that feel empowered to be involved in whatever social issues that they choose to care about. My project is the Utah 100% Clean Energy School Districts Campaign, which is a team within Utah Youth Environmental Solutions. Our campaign educates young people across the state of Utah about how to feel empowered and give them the resources and tools that they need to mobilize around environmental justice. We take a group of participants and provide them the climate education and political education that they need to start their own campaign or join a team in a school district that already exists. Our mission is to connect students to environmental advocacy by cultivating reciprocal relationships between youth, environmental organizations, and community leaders. We utilize systems-based thinking to pragmatically address local energy and water issues and increase youth access to political engagement through our clean energy campaigns and education and training campaigns. In June of 2020, Salt Lake City School District passed a resolution to commit their school district to 100% clean energy, and that was completely youth-led by students in the district. It was a really unique and special experience. It was sort of a team where characteristics that have seemed to divide us, that is age and race and gender, and, and religion, those were the things that brought my team together. And it was really the cultivation of an intergenerational movement with this youth-led team and adult allies supporting us and providing us with the resources and mobilizing resources to sort of see this energy transition through. In 2022, students in Davis County wrote and passed a revised energy policy for energy efficiency, electrification, and building upgrades that resulted in national recognition from the Department of Energy and the Department of Education. We want to see all 41 Utah school districts to convert to 100% clean energy, which has significant effects on student absence rates, student health and learning, and STEM learning. The, the opportunity to learn in buildings that are completely powered by renewable energy provides incredible opportunities for building this generation of environmentally conscious young people. These efforts will be done in tandem with the Climate Education and Training Team, which prepares participants to plan a campaign and supports graduates in joining and or launching a clean energy campaign in their school district. Last summer, the team organized a die-in demonstration at the Great Salt Lake to draw attention to Utah's water crisis. The climate training program is integral to the success and longevity of the clean energy campaigns. Through this program, we will onboard 15 to 20 youth leaders every year who will expand and sustain existing clean energy campaigns and launch new campaigns in previously underrepresented school districts. The climate training program will ensure that the campaign's clean energy work can and will continue and expand until all school districts in the state have fully transitioned to clean energy in 2050. The Utah 100% School Districts campaign is unique because it amplifies and puts young people as the leaders. I've often felt that in Utah, the story that's highlighted is people who have had the opportunity to camp and to hike and to ski and to rock climb. And that's what's motivated them to conserve the outdoors, which is beautiful. But from my experience and working with other young people, there's another story to it. And that is the story of environmental justice. I got into this work because my mother's health and my family's health and my community's health was, was put at risk because of the location of our home. And that's the story that we in, in UES and in the Clean School Districts campaign choose to amplify and put those leaders and those young people forward as, as, the, as the faces to sort of highlight a different aspect of environmental justice. It's not just about conserving outdoor spaces, but it's a, about protecting our health and, and protecting the safety of our communities. Young people have a lot of energy to care. We are inheriting this earth and the world that surrounds us. And what's really special about you, yes, and the young people that I have had the privilege of, of getting to work with and collaborate with is this commitment to justice. We learn about the way that we can collaborate across lines, bringing people together to see the solution that's really good and equitable for everybody. 
I'm so grateful to have had amazing people around me who helped me understand the power of my story and sharing it. And I'm really excited to continue to be doing that within the Clean Schools campaign and within you, yes. I live experiences that straddle the line between pain and access to power. I'm an environmental justice organizer working with school boards to develop a climate action plan for 100% clean energy transition, but often join meetings having just harvested herbs with my grandmother while breathing in pollution from neighboring refineries that cause my mom's lung disease. Joining the environmental movement, a virus danced across the world, masks impeding our exhalation, body cameras caught the pleas of I can't breathe, and tear gas raged on civilians. Youth were fatigued and mobilization was fractured. Noticing the impact of refineries encircling my childhood home implored me to ask, how do we cope with the loss of our home? How can a just transition create solutions that allow people to stay in the home that they love? These are questions that force us into action, to give ourselves to something greater than ourselves, force us to do things that we're scared to do and show up in spaces that we're scared to be in. And while it takes the greatest amount of emotional labor to fight against the forces that scare us the most, I organize around issues that impact my community directly because the people closest to pain should be the closest to power. In 2019, Salt Lake City experienced some of the worst air quality in the nation, but no statistic can truly encapsulate that experience. So I launched a grassroots campaign in 2020 to commit my school district to 100% clean energy by 2030, leveraging the role of K-12 public schools. I built and led a team ranging from school-age kids to college students to teachers and community members. And as the lead organizer, I sought to cultivate spaces where we could solicit honesty about perspectives, listen actively, and embrace disagreement. While crises were compounding, this space provided solace and common ground to adjudicate with each other. A community of activists had sprung from this, providing stamina and inspiration. We infused our relationships to each other with understanding and integrity as we embarked on an empathetic protest of the social movement ecosystem. We rallied around art, passion, and people to build collective power, the type of power that no one could silence or dismantle, power passed through stories and acts of resistance. And as I stand here, it's extremely clear to me that this award isn't for Muskan Walia, that this story is not my own. This award belongs to you, yes, the Utah Chapter Sierra Club, to Ava, Blake, Gray, Lola, Alan, Emma, Anna, Leia, Sophia, Rebecca, Maria, and so many others who give up their time and their energy and their effort to make this movement work. This is an award to celebrate we, we who don't just act on issues, but activate those around us. We who rally behind each other, every person and ideas. We who put wind in the sail of ideas that create space for things that may be completely brand new. Ideas that push the needle forward and help us feel justice, foster respect, kindness and compassion and encourage us to take care of each other. I stand here on the sturdy shoulders of the many people who have come before me, stood beside me, and challenged me. Many who showed me how to be a good steward of relationships and helped me understand the importance of building people up and leaving them better than you found them. My journey as a youth activist involves a whole community. It's about the dimensionality of how people live. It's motivated by the fact that the meaning of advocacy is and should be made by the people who need it the most and that to find joy amongst each other, we must be willing to forgo individual profit for the common good. As the student leader of the 100% Clean Energy Campaign, I have been deceived, I've been fed distorted narratives and empty promises by legislators, agencies, and administration. And I too had the chance to resort to speaking with media outlets and public shaming to feel seen and achieve that 100% clean energy transition. But I learned that nothing is accomplished if you neglect fostering human decency and empathy in the face of human suffering. 
integrity encouraged me to understand that I was sculpted by the way that I acted when truth and goodness were on the line. So I embraced the messiness of our interconnectedness with the youth team and the school administrators and continued to forge trust. This appreciation and celebration that I am because we are, it's what connects you to me. And it's through our inhalations and exhalations that we were reminded how beautifully blurry the boundary between bodies are that we are entangled within each other. And I have found that when we allow the people we meet to touch our hearts and our focus shifts from me to, me, from me to we, we can all rise together. Thank you, Earth Island, for this incredible award. We're incredibly humble and, humbled and, and grateful. Thank you. What an incredible evening. Thank you to the 2023 winners, not just for the work that you're doing in your communities, but for your openness and willingness to share those stories with us and serve as a source of inspiration. My name is Rhiannon Tom Titian, and I am a previous Brower Youth Award winner and a current Earth Island Institute New Leaders Initiative monthly donor. <laughs> A night like tonight, but more importantly, a movement like the one that the Brower Youth Awards is creating is not possible without the significant investment of time and financial resources to make this possible. So I want to take a few brief moments, not just to let you know how you can donate, but also why that support is so important. I received a Brower Youth Award in 2011 for the work that my campaign co-founder, Madison Borba, and I did to raise awareness about the implications of unsustainable palm oil production and to encourage Girl Scouts USA to adopt a responsible sourcing policies for the iconic Girl Scout cookie. <laughs> Today, I work for a climate finance coalition to help mobilize investment in emerging markets for climate. Thank you. <laughs> What I really wanted to share, though, is that the Brower Youth Awards was so impactful to my life for, for two key reasons. First, related to the campaign, the tremendous platform that this award provided helped us amplify our message, build a network of well-aligned partners, and build momentum on our fight to change the way that palm oil is sourced. At the time that we received the Brower Youth Award, less than 5% of globally traded palm oil was sourced under responsible sourcing policies. Two years after we won the award, both Girl Scouts USA and Kellogg's, their baker, had adopted responsible sourcing policies that had ripple effects across the entire food industry. <laughs> Today, over 90% of globally traded palm oil is sourced under these responsible sourcing policies. But perhaps even more important than the impact to the campaign was the impact that this award had on me personally because it provided a validation of something that I thought was true, but didn't know if anybody else believed. And that is that there's no age requirement for leadership or impact. The youth of today are not the leaders of tomorrow, they're the leaders of today. They're creating change, they're making their voices heard, and they're making a difference. And to me, that is where a movement is created. And the fact that you've heard that message from almost every single winner tonight is proof of the fact that this is working. I took a little stroll down memory lane and I dug up the speech that Maddie and I gave on this stage 12 years ago. And I wanna read a line because I think it's a message that you heard repeated today. As youth, we have the luxury of imagining a vision that appears irrational. And we can dream in a way that is not limited by an adult's perspective. One day, our generation will take up traditional leadership roles, and we hope that tomorrow's youth will continue to do what is right. That's why I support the Earth Island Institute's New Leaders Initiative, not only because of the impact that it had on my own life, but because of the fact that it's elevating, it's amplifying the critical voices of today's youth to remind us all to do what is right, to inspire us all to do what is right. 
So I'm a monthly donor, and I'll be making a special donation tonight in celebration of this year's winners and all that they've done and all that they'll continue to do as agents of change. And I really hope that you'll join me. If you're able, whether it's $5 or $50 or $500, I hope you know that you're part not just of this moment, but of a movement of youth leaders that are creating change. Thank you. Well, that was our show for tonight. It was amazing. I would like to invite all of the winners back up on the stage. For one final bow. <laughs>